If you could please start by introducing yourself. Sorry? Could you please start by introducing yourself? I am uh, Brian Webster, Major General Brian Webster, uh, of the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers. In what part of Britain did you grow up? Which part of? Britain did you grow up in? In, in London. Uh, what made you decide, decide sorry, to join the army? Well, my father was in the Fusiliers, and from the time I was a very small boy, uh, I just knew that he wanted me to go into the army, and I wanted to follow his footsteps into the regiment. And that's how it came about. He unfortunately was killed in action in France in 1940, when I was aged eight, and so I only knew him for really not much of your, my young life. Okay. He served in the First World War <coughs> and got through that and was killed in action in the Second. Because people fail to realise even now how close the two world wars were in a matter of 20 years. Uh, I understand you attended Sandhurst. What yes. was the <coughs> training there like? Yes, um, <coughs> I was at Sandhurst in 1950. Fifty, uh, forty-nine, fifty, fifty-one. In those days, it was a two-year course. Um, <clears throat> before you went to Sandhurst in those days, you had to do other rank training, which meant you were a private soldier, and you did a number of months before you went to Sandhurst. Now, of course, you go straight to Sandhurst. Um, <clears throat> it was a good preparation, and uh, as I say, in those days, a two-year course. Uh, these days it's much shorter. And so I was commissioned from Sandhurst in February 1951. Uh, what made you choose to join the Army and not the Air Force or the Navy? Well, as I say, my father's a soldier, um, so I never really considered either of the other two services. Um, you went to Korea in 1952. Uh, how was the journey there? What was it like? To Korea? Korea, yes. Uh, yes, uh, uh, we went, in those days, all troop movements and long distance were by sea. Hard to believe now, when everyone flies everywhere. But uh, yes, uh, by troop ship, and there were about a dozen troop ships in service. And we went out um, uh, to Korea by sea, calling in at all day. In those days, what was still part of the British Empire, in Aden, Ceylon, Singapore. And it took almost four weeks to get from England to Korea by, by boat. And uh, what was a typical day in Korea like for you? A typical day? That's very difficult to, to describe because um, we arrived, the Korean War started in 1950. So the battalion didn't arrive in Korea until 1952, by which time the lines of combat had become sort of static, rather like the First World War, in which the, the enemy, the Chinese, were dug in in lots of very strong positions, and we similarly were dug in on our side of the valley or whatever it was. We kept on changing position every so often. Uh, a typical day in in the combat zone would be mainly um, keeping cover by day because probably all the fighting was done at night. The reason being that uh, any movement by day could be seen by the enemy uh, and uh, one would be shelled or mortared or shot at um, pretty quickly. So apparently all the fighting was done at night. And the sort of routine, I mean, you ask me what a typical day would be like, um, the first light, early morning, one would prefer the uh, position, clean it up, dig a little deeper trenches if they needed it. Because the weather was very difficult in Korea. The winters were bitterly cold, minus 30, 40 degrees. Uh, and the summers uh, were very wet. They had a sort of monsoon, torrential rain, which turned the 
the muddy trenches and the tracks and the roads into complete uh, morass. So tidy up the position and then um, one would start the cleaning weapons uh, and, and then briefing, uh, getting ready for the night's activities, which for most fusiliers and officers would entail uh, patrolling, a lot of patrolling, and uh, different types of patrols, what called a standing patrol, which would be about three men, that would be out in front of one's, one's position, and their job was to give warning of any enemy approach. Uh, and then there was a reconnaissance patrol, which is a very, very dangerous business, in which again three or four men, or perhaps more, would go out to try and find where the enemy were. And then the last, but not least, the biggest one, the fighting patrol, in which you'd go out into the paddy fields and so on and lay up an ambush position. <coughs> oh, sorry. Um, what was your role in the Battle of the Hook? The Battle of the Hook? Well, the Hook was a peculiar uh, piece of ground, uh, what is called in the army vital ground. In fact, it's vital to hold that particular ground because it's in such a, an important position. And... The, in May 1953, in May 1953, the, the position was held by the Duke of Wellington's regiment, and on the night, I think, of the 29th, they were attacked by a Chinese uh, brigade, a very large attack, and were very badly uh, shot up. And early that morning, we were told to take over the position. And I, Second Lieutenant Webster, was told to take over the forward platoon position, actually on the front of the sort of hook, which is very nasty. <coughs> I was wondering, were you in Korea for the celebrations of the Queen's coronation? Sorry? Were you in Korea during the celebrations of the Queen's coronation? Yes. Uh, I remember it very well, in fact. I think it was um, June the 2nd. I think it probably yeah, I think around June then. The 2nd, yes. yes um, in fact, I was in my uh, command post, my uh, dugout, um, uh, that morning, and my batman, the soldier who you know, looked after me, sort of didn't clean my boots, <laughs> clean my gun for me. Um, we toasted the Queen's health, uh, in, in, uh, we had a bottle of champagne, believe it or not. We toasted the Queen's health. And I was looking at a letter I wrote home at that time to my brother in England, uh, saying that, um, I said, um, I'm so glad the coronation seemed to have gone so well. A pity it rained. Uh, did you enjoy travelling to different parts of the world in your career? Yes, I did. I've been very lucky, actually, because um, in those days, the vast proportion of the army was stationed in Germany. And I did very little service in Germany. <coughs> Not that I don't like Germany particularly, but it's just that that was rather dull soldiering compared to soldiering in other parts. So I was lucky, yes, Korea, um, Egypt... Um, a bit of Germany, India, uh, Malaya, yes, all over. Uh, then in 1956, I understand you travelled to Egypt, as you said. Uh, what was the journey to Egypt like? <laughs> yes, the journey to Egypt was a very strange journey because uh, the Suez crisis, when the Egyptians took over the Suez Canal, uh, it was obviously viewed very, very seriously by everybody. And uh, the British Army embarked on a, a, an operation to, to retake the Suez Canal with the French. And um, at the same time, the Israelis were, were, were fighting um, uh, in the, across the canal, obviously, the other side of the canal in their country. And the journey out, we went in a, a ship called the New Australia, which was an immigrant ship. It was an extraordinary ship, really, and uh, I think there were places for 1,500 passengers 
and we embarked 3,000 sailors. <laughs> and I shared a cabin with uh, six officers, which was a, a three berth cabin, I think. And we drew lots of who would get the berth, and uh, I lost, so I slept on the floor. It was, it was a, a funny journey, but <clears throat> we didn't really know at that stage where we were going. We knew, obviously, there was an operation going on in Suez, but we thought we might be going to Cyprus first and then wait to see how things developed. In fact, yeah, I remember it very well as we were sailing in the Mediterranean on a lovely evening. A British destroyer came up alongside and the captain uh, shouted through his loud hailer. I'm uh, glad to see you in Australia. I'm taking you into Port Side, which is easy. Um, <coughs> what were the living conditions like in Egypt? Because I was reading you stayed in a hospital and a school. Yes, we stayed, we we um, we landed um, in Port Said and uh, marched to uh, yes a beach, almost on the beach, a school which of course the married children there had all been vacated. And uh, we lived there for the next, I think, several weeks. Uh, what were your duties as a signal officer? Ah, signal officer. Well, to keep in contact with the companies, the, the battalion was split up and, and, and platoons, 30 odd men, and companies, 120 men, were put out in different locations. So my job as signal officer was to keep battalion headquarters in the school where I was in contact with all the companies out in the stick. And this was quite amusing because um, we had no transport. All our trucks, uh, jeeps and so on, had been wrongly loaded back in England before the operation and they hadn't reached us, so we had no transport at all which made life pretty difficult because I had to get round quite big distances. However, my fusiliers, um, never lacking in initiative, uh, they, um, how should we say it, commandeered a, a very large brand new Cadillac from uh, an Egyptian showroom and I had it for my use, it was very nice. And how did you spend your free time when you were in Egypt? There wasn't any. 